Hello and welcome back to English 332. In this lecture, we're talking about one of my favorite topics, really the, the topic that got me interested in, the, in this field, uh, namely creating persuasive messages. So we're beyond being clear or beyond being correct. Now we're getting into how do you make this message more persuasive? How do you get people to uh, warm warm up to your point of view? That's the uh, the topic here. And we got uh, we have uh, seven objectives here. We'll be talking about the purposes, uh, why you'd want to be persuasive in a message, uh, different kinds of situations, some basic strategies, uh, and then different situations uh, for persuasion and direct request, problem solving. Uh, one of my favorites, the sales and fundraising message. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, the technology you can use for all this stuff. Anyway, I think it's really fascinating. Hopefully you will as well. Certainly very useful stuff, no matter what kind of field you're interested in going into. Uh, so let's get started. All right, so let's take a look here at the purposes of persuasive uh, messages in business communication. And as usual, they split them into primary and secondary. And of course, the primary or the most obvious reason that you're trying to persuade somebody, right, is to have them act or do something. Maybe that's buy a product. Uh, adopt a policy, uh, update their software, uh, whatever it may be, uh, or though uh, to change beliefs about something. So maybe you're not looking for a specific action uh, so much as you're trying to affect the way they look at things. And uh, you could imagine there, uh, I think about a preacher's sermon uh, might be trying to change somebody's beliefs, but it could be um, uh, beyond religion and politics. Uh, you could imagine a business wanting to change uh, people's beliefs about, let's say, uh, global uh, warming, right? That's an example. So that might negatively impact your bottom line, uh, but nevertheless, that might be something that's desirable if you get the uh, if you get people to buy into it. Uh, now, secondary uh, purposes would be uh, again this broader concern, sort of the bigger picture here. It's always about the good image of the, the communicator, which is you, right? A lot of uh, salespeople get negative. People have bad images about them. They use the stereotype of the used car salesman, the shady dealer. <laughs> uh, that's not what you want. You want to have this uh, good image so people will trust you, take you seriously. Uh, and then, of course, beyond you, it's it's also as part of that organization, part of that company, you're affecting their brand as well. Uh, so if you are dishonest, disreputable, um, <laughs> or just not persuasive, uh, that might come back to impact that whole company. So that's a, another issue. And then finally, it's, it's beyond that, whatever the situation is where you're trying to be persuasive, uh, you have the, unless it's just a one-off kind of one-time um, situation, uh, you want to have a, a good relationship that you're working towards even with this, right? So you want uh, you want the customer to come back to your store uh, again, right? <laughs> so uh, even if you're able to apply uh, strong arm tactics, let's say, to get them to buy something one time, they might never come back. Uh, and that would be uh, worse in the long run. So uh, those are all of the purposes we'll be talking about. Uh, <laughs> left off one or uh, maybe two here uh, to overcome any objections. And I think there's one more, yeah. Uh, to reduce or eliminate future messages on the subject. So this, these last two kind of have been with us uh, throughout all these messages. Uh, ideally, uh, you have a, you don't want to have to keep responding to back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's, it's better. It saves a lot of time and money, of course, when you can handle that in a single message. So how do you do this? How do you persuade somebody? And it's a big question. Obviously, nobody has this down uh, to a precise science, or they would be the unquestioned ruler of the world <laughs> if you had that kind of power. Uh, we're not really talking about being able to mentally uh, manipulate somebody, uh, at least in a direct uh, fashion, but we can try to make our messages more persuasive. It's basically the goal here. Uh, you don't want to do anything that's going to make your success less likely. So here's some, some questions to ask when you're thinking about choosing a persuasive strategy. One is just, what do you want the people to do? Uh, what are you trying to convince them to do? And it, again, it could be just you're changing their beliefs, or maybe you're trying to achieve a certain, uh, make a certain decision. Coming back to this car, uh, use car sales 
<laughs> analogy. Uh, one of the things they hammer into those salespeople is close, you know, seal the deal. And as soon as you close the deal, uh, get them, you know, get those papers signed and, and get them, you know, get <laughs> get them the car. Uh, you don't want people to be uh, saying, "Well, I'll think about it and come back the next day," right? Because they more than likely won't won't come back. And so it's important for them to seal the deal that day. Uh, that's what you want. You don't want them to be um, thinking about it too much, I guess. Oh, uh, what objections will the audience have? You know, this is just basic rhetoric, right? Uh, there's a lot of other cars that they could buy. Maybe they you think they won't like the, <laughs> the sticker price uh, on that car. Uh, how strong a case can you make? So sometimes you're arguing something that there's a lot of facts on your side, uh, but sometimes it's kind of weak, you know, and it doesn't, you can't just choose the sides always that are the winners. And, you know, sometimes you find yourself uh, trying to defend the underdog. Uh, so that can affect the persuasion. Uh, what kind of persuasion is best uh, for the situation? Again, these uh, salespeople on the car lots, they, they've got it down to basically a science. So as soon as they see you walk up, they're sort of sizing you up, thinking about what kind of person you are. Are you young? Are you older? Uh, do you look, you know, what kind of car are you driving up in, right? And so they can use all that information to determine the right approach. Uh, so they don't want to approach a a respectable <laughs> you know, older man with some kind of hey yo what's up come check out this uh, Mustang you know probably not going to be the best approach in that situation uh, let's see what kind of persuasion is best for organization and culture um, so this again is we're going to get in, into this a little bit uh, the different companies like Google uh, different uh, cultures around the world, uh, international cultures, even cultures within Minnesota, even. Uh, they, they're, of course, very different cultures and they have very different things that work and don't work in terms of persuasion. So I think this is a, a really interesting one, too. All right, the three aspects of persuasion, and you might have heard about these in uh, if you took a 191 course or a rhetoric course. Uh, they usually use Aristotle and talk about ethos, logos, and pathos. Uh, in this book, they just use <laughs> plain English to kind of skip skip on the uh, terminology, but it's the same basic stuff. Uh, argument, <clears throat> excuse me, reasons or logic uh, that the communicator offers. Uh, credibility, uh, the audience's response to the communicator as a source of the message, and uh, this is uh, let me just start over here. So the argument, this would be what we would call the logos uh, in the classical rhetoric tradition. So if you're trying arguing again about this car, uh, well, the salesperson knows some things about the car. Uh, they know how much it's, it costs, the gas mileage, the, the speed, uh, maybe what the uh, rivals, how it's better than these other cars. Uh, so they can try to talk to you just based on just sound, logical reasons why this car is better than another car. Uh, that's one approach. It's probably the least effective. <laughs> uh, they talk about this in the book several times that people don't really make decisions based on logic. Uh, you know, we're not Vulcans like Spock uh, from Star Trek. <laughs> Quite the opposite. Uh, we're much more driven by uh, these other factors, but nevertheless, it's there. And arguably, one of the purposes of a college education is to get you to appreciate this more and to be able to look at yourself and say, look, am I acting logically or am I just falling prey to this uh, emotional content? Uh, so that's <laughs> one of the goals is when somebody tells you you need to think more rationally. Uh, they're talking about this first one. Uh, the second one, credibility, this is what we would call in a rhetoric class ethos. Uh, so it's your, yeah, your credibility, your, you know, do they think that you're an expert on the topic? If I'm up here talking about grammar, let's say, and I have this lecture about comma usage, you'd probably take it pretty seriously. You'd be persuaded that I'm telling the truth and you, sh and you should listen to it because I'm a, I'm a professor of English, right? That goes a long way. Uh, if I'm just some random person, uh, maybe somebody, maybe a kid, a uh, younger person that doesn't have a, <laughs> you know, they, they might know their stuff, but nevertheless, they would, they would have to work harder. 
uh, to convince you that they are in fact an expert. Uh, the image uh, that you put out, uh, the relationships, you know, all of this stuff, people that, you know, the, the salespeople, this is one of the main keys to being successful, right? As I buy a car from the Dodge place here in town, I work with a certain salesperson. Um, one of my friends is looking for a car. So I'll say, look, I had a great time. I, I know this guy at the Dodge place, really nice guy. I think you'll like him. Uh, that will uh, make my friend more likely to be, take this person, assume he's credible, you know, hey, <laughs> uh, Matt seems to like him. Uh, Matt wouldn't lie, uh, so I'll uh, trust this, uh, trust his opinion on that. So all that goes towards the credibility or the uh, ethos. And then the last one is the emotional appeal. And this one here, I think Aristotle said that, maybe it was Cicero, <laughs> one of them uh, said that credibility is the most important. Uh, but usually, uh, people say that the emotional is what really works the best. And this is, of course, just appealing to your emotions. And we'll get more into this, but you can think about all of those ads where they, you know, the starving animal that the, <laughs> you know, donate to uh, the, the human, humane society and they'll show you those poor animals and you tear up and you get you reach for the, uh, the checkbook, right? And that's an, that's because they use an emotional appeal on you and they tend to work well. Same thing with they can make you fearful, make you upset about something. Uh, that's going to get you to act. And, and arguably, it's the only thing that really gets you to, <laughs> to do anything. Uh, if you don't want something, you know, why would you even bother with these other two, right? Now, we're going to delve more into these different patterns. But for now, we're just talking about sort of what they are. Um, the direct request pattern, you will use this when you don't expect the audience to resist. Or they're not likely to disagree with you. Uh, it's, some, it's something, it's some small thing uh, that they can easily do. It's not going to be a big deal. And then uh, you might use this if there's not a lot of time uh, to read the, this message. Uh, so you can imagine some little thing uh, like maybe uh, you're looking at your grade book on <laughs> D2L. You see, oh, it looks like uh, Dr. Barton put the wrong score. Uh, on this on this uh, assignment, I you know I can show him the right score here on Connect, and <laughs> you know, he he should just go change that. Uh, well, I'm not going to argue obviously about that. It's just a simple thing, uh, so it checks boxes uh, one and two, and uh, box number three comes into play because uh, if you want me to do that, I need I need to be able to get to the request quickly. Uh, again, I get flooded with email, and if it's if you've written some long long email and it's not really clear what you're requesting, it's not likely to be very persuasive, right? So that would be a situation where a direct request pattern uh, would be best. Just what, <laughs> what do you need me to do? <laughs> and put that up, up top. Uh, the problem solving pattern, uh, this is where you do expect some resistance. Uh, so you're going to frame, uh, your frame your persuasion a little differently. You'll be using this problem solving approach which we'll talk about here in a minute. And it's also situations where you think they'll be more logical. So it's not, it's more of a dry <laughs> decision. It's not necessarily a life changing, uh, scary or, or something that's going to make them angry. It's just, uh, just sort of routine stuff, but they might disagree. And then my favorite, the, the sales pattern, this is where you, they may resist <laughs> doing what you ask. I mean, obviously, yeah, they got the old car lot here. Uh, that's a classic. You talk a lot about used car lots <laughs> rhetoric class. But, uh, it looks like you've got a couple here and a, the salesperson. Now, obviously, they're there. Uh, they want to buy a car. They wouldn't be there, right? But there's a lot of, um, <clears throat> they might go to a different lot. Uh, they might not want to pay as much as uh, you <laughs> as the car is worth and so on. And so you expect some resistance in those situations. And you expect emotion to be uh, more important than logic and I find a hard, it's hard for me to think of too many situations where emotion isn't uh, the most important thing, but uh, you could certainly think about this car lot. There's, I can't tell you how many times I've gone on to a car lot thinking, well, this time I'm just going to get the, the you know, the, the cheap, <laughs> most economical, uh, most boring, uh, reliable vehicle. You know, I've looked at consumer reports, and yada, yada. 
<laughs> all that as soon as you see that that sleek sporty car you know all that just <laughs> run out the window <laughs> and you're just acting entirely on emotion and uh, you know you could blame you could feel bad about that but i just think that's the way humans are uh white threats don't persuade uh I can't think of too many uh, people who would think otherwise. We don't like being threatened. <laughs> you think about being a kid and you're, as soon as your parents tell you, you know, don't do this or don't go in this room or don't ever open this safe. Well, look, what does that do? You know, and if they pile on the threats, well, and, and if you do, you'll be grounded for uh, two weeks. <laughs> All that makes you think is, well, there must be something really great inside that chest, you know? Maybe it's worth the risk. Uh, so they don't really work very well. Uh, not to mention, then, as you get older, of course, this could lead to, to hostile work environments and even criminal. It could be criminal acts. And if you tell somebody, hey, if you do this, I will kill you. Well, that's uh, you, know, you, you can be put in jail for uh, saying stuff like that, even if you don't really mean it. Uh, but you really should never say it anyway, because it's just not it's just not effective in the real world anyway. Uh, so yeah, doesn't produce permanent change. Uh, may not produce <laughs> the desired action. You know, right? Some people might just say, "Well, if you're just going to threaten me, I'm out of here." Right? Uh, may make <laughs> may make people abandon uh, the action. <laughs> produce tension. Yeah, you think? <laughs> yeah, uh, if people get nervous, uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm kind of using this extreme example, but you know, just thinking about a factory floor setting. And you go out there one day and you say, look, we've got to get our quotas up and anybody that's not pulling their weight will be fired at the end of the day. And I'm going to find out whoever is the lowest performer will be fired. Uh, well, you just made a threat and maybe it will temporarily boost uh, production, but everybody there is going to resent it. Uh, they're not going to like it. Uh, they might even just say, well, to hell with you and just <laughs> walk off. Uh, anyway, it's not going to lead to a productive uh, setting. Yeah, people dislike the one who threatens. Uh, this could be, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if you would dislike them more if you thought that they could follow through on it, <laughs> you know, how that would uh, affect it. But yeah, people just don't really like uh, this. Uh, they don't, who was it, a Ma Machiavelli? <laughs> I read a book called The Prince where he talks about the, uh, the prince can either be loved or feared. <laughs> kind of either or. Uh, situation there and of course uh, most of them would rather be feared but uh, maybe you're better off being liked uh, it can provoke counter aggression yeah so we talked you know they can go on strike or they could uh, if you ever heard this term ludite uh, those were people that would just break up the machines at the factories because they thought the uh, machines were taking their jobs right and they were uh, somebody come in and start threatening and that would make that even more likely so how do you organize, now we're talking about the direct request, uh, the first one we're talking about. So remember, this is just some simple thing. It's not something somebody's going to object to. You know, if I sent you an email and said, I, uh, please uh, fill out this uh, form, <laughs> work with a lot of uh, uh, graduate students and they're doing their theses about this time of the, of the semester and they're setting up these uh, defenses and they'll, uh, they need to figure out a time that works for everybody and they'll, you know, it's just a simple thing. Nobody on the committee is going to say, no, I, I'm not going to do it. It's just trying to find a work out of time, right? Uh, so that's the, the best strategy is to get right to the point. Professors are very, very, very busy people. Uh, so you don't want them to have to read a long, length, beefy paragraph of uh, fluff before they figure out what it is. So what do you want? You might just say, I'm writing to set up a time or I need you to uh, tell me some times you'd be available for the defense. Uh, give audience all the information they need to act on your request. Uh, this is a big one. Uh, this this probably happens more than any other thing that I get from students. They will uh, not tell me what class they're in. So they'll just say something about I'm, I'm missing a grade on an assignment or, or can I make uh, I missed a quiz or, or something like this. But I don't know uh, what class they're in. So I have to look them up <laughs> or I have to send them back an email and say, OK, well, what? What class are you in? That, that sort of thing. Uh, so that wastes time, right? And they should have just put that in the email. 
uh, ask for the action you want. Uh, that should be pretty uh, obvious, but maybe uh, maybe you feel a little shy about asking for it directly or something. I don't know. But uh, again, think about the situation here. It's not something they're going to uh, object to. So just be uh, upfront. Now, this next one is the problem solving approach. Uh, so you've probably seen this before. We, we could talk about politicians use it all the time, right? <laughs> You know, here's this big problem. Uh, there's a problem with the, the tax code, let's say, or a business situation. Maybe there's a maybe the problem is the, the profits are down, <laughs> or the product wise uh, not selling as much this quarter as it was last quarter, right? So that's so that's the problem, right? And then you have a solution uh, worked out. That's what you're trying to persuade them that you have a good solution. <laughs> and so they say here, catch the audience's interest by mentioning common ground and now again in, in rhetoric they talk about you know, kenneth burke is a uh, did a lot of uh, theory theoretical work around this and he said that really the way you persuade somebody is by getting them to identify uh, their way with your way or, I, basically it's about identifying <laughs> you know if, if we feel like somebody is like us and they have our common interest uh, well, that'll go a long ways towards persuading them. We'll buy into their solution. If we're looking at them and thinking, wow, this person has nothing in common with me. Uh, we have no common ground. Uh, this person uh, couldn't be more different than I am. Well, then they're going to have to work a lot harder. Uh, so I don't, <laughs> don't want to get into the politics that we're going through these days. But uh, you could think about how certain politicians appeal more to, I say, the blue collar folks. Other ones might have a more of a white collar repeal. Uh, they really work hard to convince you that they, they're, you have common ground with them. All right, defining the problem that you share with the audience. Uh, so this can get uh, tricky with these politicians, right? Because if they're probably millionaires, if not billionaires, and they're trying to make out like they share your problems, and you're <laughs> probably thinking, eh. <laughs> uh, but maybe there's some problem that they share. Uh, maybe they're concerned about security or whatever. You know, you can. Uh, it's probably easier to think about a corporate situation again, where uh, you know everybody in that company is affected by this problem, right? If, this, if the sales are down, or here at SCSU, if the uh, enrollments are down, uh, that's that's the problem. It's not just like, well, that's your fault. <laughs> no, that actually affects me too. That affects all of the uh, everybody at SCSU is affected by that. So. Uh, you could spell that out and that would uh, again go a long ways towards getting people to focus in and, and realize that they need to listen uh, explaining the solution to the problem uh, that's of course crucial right yeah we got a problem but <laughs> what are we going to do about it it doesn't do much good to just be uh, raising problems that don't have a uh, solutions and that's just basically a waste of time uh, show that the advantages outweigh the negatives <clears throat> so with this one again, you can think about, uh, well, maybe one of the solutions offered there is we need more billboards. We need to increase the marketing budget. Well, there's a negative there, right? It's going to cost more money. Uh, they won't be able to update some computers, maybe. Or they'll have less money for new hires. Uh, won't be able to offer as many scholarships. Uh, there, there's going to be negatives, but maybe you could show, well, yeah, but there's going to be those negatives, but when the enrollment goes up, goes back up uh, that's going to uh, make these <laughs> negligible uh, summarizing additional benefits of the solution uh, that's that's nice too if you can feel like yes yeah, there's some negatives we're gonna have to deal with this for a while tighten our belts whatnot but uh, there will be this big advantage and then there's all this uh, I guess you could call them sub or secondary advantages maybe get the word out more more brand recognition uh, we'll build some relationships maybe we can have some uh, students intern at the marketing uh, firm that we hire and so on and again asking for the action that you <laughs> want uh, so there's nothing more annoying I think than a when you watch a commercial or a sales pitch and, or whatever it is and you're not really sure what what is what is this about what do, what do they want me to think or do <laughs> I always think that's totally pointless uh, you know it should be pretty clear if you want you want me to go buy the product or you want me to try the, the sample or, or whatever it is all right so we talked about how important this is the uh, developing common ground getting them to identify 
with you and your cause. And I was thinking about this uh, a couple days ago. You, you hear in the news about these different marches that are going on, uh, political stuff. And you, usually the theme, uh, a lot of the times, will be the reporters will be out there interviewing people in those crowds, and they'll ask them, well, you know, here's this issue. Let's have a logical argument about, about it. <laughs> you know, why are you here? And a lot of the times the folks there will just kind of stammer and like, well, I don't, you know, <laughs> maybe they'll just repeat something they heard. Uh, but it gets to be pretty clear that they, they're not there out of any logical, rational reason. Uh, no, and, it, and that just goes along with what we're talking about here in, in the common ground and identification. What happens is, uh, you know, you might look outside and see people uh, organizing for a march, and you're going to either look at them and, and think, well, those are people just like me. You know, look, they look like me, <laughs> act like me. Uh, that's my crowd. That's my group. Or at least that's a group I'd like to be associated with. I'd like to be part of that group. Uh, so you go march with them based on that. Uh, whereas if you look at them and you're like, oh, man, look at those people. Wow, <laughs> they look crazy. <laughs> I, I could, I don't want anything to do with them. Uh, that's really how, according to this identification theory, that's really how more more often than not how stuff works. Uh, it's a lot more based on that wanting to fit in with the group you desire to be part of. It has a lot more to do with it than somebody sitting down and saying, okay, look, let's talk about this issue rationally, A, B, and C, you know, it just doesn't work like that. So what does this have to do with the business writing? Well, a lot, of it, a lot of it is the same principles. So we had this audience there, and it could be, let's say we want to update our software, right? So one of the situations I'm dealing with now of my many uh, committee obligations, uh, they're talking about this new version of D2L, and it's going to be cloud-based. It basically means that they won't be running the, the software won't actually be running here on campus. It'll be handled, they'll basically outsource everything uh, to the D2L Brightspace company. And there's some pluses and minuses to go with that, right? Um, <clears throat> I don't need to get into it here. <laughs> Uh, but nevertheless, uh, supposedly this cloud solution will solve some problems, right? So that'd be the first step. If they want us to invest in this update, uh, they have to suggest to us uh, here at SESU, or I guess at Minsky or wherever, whoever makes the final decision, look, we have a mutual interest in solving this problem. And uh, in that case, the problem is all these, every campus having its own servers and dedicated support teams and technical folks, and they, they say we could also, we could solve all this and get rid of a lot of redundancy basically by keeping all of it in-house. Uh, analyzing audiences to understand biases, objections, and needs. Uh, so the way they uh, have to do this, you, you can think about how different it would be if they're arguing with the computer experts here on campus, the people that uh, manage the software. Uh, they, they know it a lot better. Uh, they probably won't have the same objections. They're not actually using it. Uh, like a professor would be using it, right? And much less uh, prof professors in different fields have different needs, right? A mathematics professor needs to be able to input all kinds of weird symbols and formula. <laughs> uh, English professors want a way that they can look at papers and make comments easily on the papers. Uh, different biases. You know, a lot of uh, professors don't even like technology. <laughs> <laughs> they say, hey, we need less of this stuff. All right, I'm just more junk to have to learn. Uh, why don't we put this money somewhere else? All right, so a good salesperson would know about all these biases in advance. And then identify uh, with the audience to find uh, common goals, right? So you could think, well, the, you got the engineer, uh, you got the teacher. <laughs> you got, uh, what are some common goals? Maybe this is the the administration over here that wants to bring in the software, right? So you, you could say, well, everybody here, uh, we value uh, efficiency, let's say. <laughs> uh, we don't want the, this if this software is breaking down all the time and it's unreliable and it's, well, let's, let's give a better example. Uh, I could think of a good common goal would be uh, to improve uh, the security, right? So we, we keep hearing about everybody's getting hacked even people like Google, <laughs> uh, even the government gets hacked all the time. So, and we've got all this confidential information we need to keep uh, secure. 
Uh, so if this uh, new software is more secure, less prone to that uh, sort of thing, that might be a common goal uh, that all these very different audiences here might all share. And you could certainly build on that. Now let's look at the dealing uh, with objections. <clears throat> you always see this. And again, we're talking here, remember, remember uh, about situations where there is likely to be resistance. Uh, so specifying the time, money uh, required to act, um, again, a lot of times uh, the salespeople will say uh, something like, well, uh, you know, you, you say you want to come back tomorrow, but I won't be able to, I'm only able to offer this particular deal, this discount until uh, the end of the day. <laughs> uh, so that means if you, it puts a little more pressure on you, right? Uh, or that coming back to this D2L situation, you know, maybe if they don't, maybe if we don't act now, everybody will go all, be off for the summer and this won't get done. And you know, it was a limited time. You had a limited time to do it. Uh, so that, that could be a problem. So a lot of times uh, you'll see in meetings, somebody will just keep objecting and maybe two or three people are raising objections. Uh, this, this looks objectionable. This looks objectionable. And you start to look at the clock and realize, Hey, we're running out of time. <laughs> Uh, you know, look, is, is there, are any of these objections so serious uh, that we need to just table this, even though we're going to have, it's going to make us have to wait till uh, next semester to deal with it? Um, so sometimes something like that, maybe they, somebody might say, well, you know, I'll just, that objection is not that serious. So I'll just, uh, you know, quit bringing it up. <laughs> uh, put the time and money in the context of the benefits. All right, so you wouldn't hear you don't hear salespeople go on about, yeah, this car is, you know, this car is sixty thousand dollars. That's going to put a big burden on you. <laughs> you're, going to, you're going to have a very high note, and you're going to have to uh, sacrifice a lot. Of, <laughs> of course, they'd never do that. Uh, they're going to emphasize, you know, how much fun you're going to have uh, in the in this car, right? Yeah, it's going to take some a lot of money, but you know, you're going to have all these wonderful benefits. <laughs> Or with a D2L, you know, yeah, it's going to take some time to set it up, some training and some money, but, you know, look, it's, it's a lot faster, a lot more reliable, <clears throat> a lot less uh, support staff needed. <clears throat> Show that money spent now uh, will save money in the long run. Now, this is a pretty, pretty common strategy. Uh, you see this all the time, right? Uh, yeah, you spend some money now uh, on the, on these, uh, <laughs> On this gym membership, let's say, <laughs> um, and it's yeah, it's expensive, but you know you're going to save a lot, a tons more uh, in medical bills uh, that you'll get, it, you'll run up if you don't exercise. <laughs> uh, and you could, that's, I'm sure you could work something like that out with the uh, D2L as well. Now show that doing as you ask will benefit something uh, that the audience cares about. Uh, so maybe this person doesn't even care about d2l right they don't care about this and so they have to find some way to make this to connect it to something else maybe they they do care about and let's just say maybe the this cloud setup will have less of a man i'm just pulling stuff out of <laughs> you know where right now <laughs> uh, let's just say that it'll reduce the carbon footprint somehow and have this less of a maybe it'll use less electricity and that'll have a <laughs> less impact on the environment <laughs> And so there you go. You might use that to appeal to somebody that doesn't even use computers, right? Maybe they're totally off the grid, uh, but maybe if you put it that way, they'll uh, think, well, okay, that sounds good. I'm convinced. Uh, show the audience need for sacrifice uh, to achieve the larger, uh, more important goal, right? So nobody, <laughs> Well, you have a limited budget to work with, right? So if you're spending all this money on upgrading D2L, that means that other areas will get less money. Uh, so why are you willing to sacrifice that? And it, it needs to be pretty clear what this larger, uh, more important goal is. And again, showing that the advantages outweigh uh, the disadvantages. And there's always going to be disadvantages to just about anything if uh, nothing else, just the time it takes to <laughs> to talk about it, <laughs> uh, that's kind of a disadvantage. Uh, so you want to make sure you factored in uh, lots of advantages and how they outweigh it. And of course, if you can't do this, uh, you probably won't be convincing. 
Uh, reasons to act promptly. Uh, so I think I used the example earlier about the salesperson, and they'll, they don't want you to say, oh, I'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to go home, do some research, look at some websites, uh, uh, see if I can find a better deal somewhere else, or maybe talk myself out of buying this car. You know, they, they realize that's what's going to happen if they let you off that lot before you sign the papers. All right, so they're going to implement these reasons. Uh, one, show that time limit is real. Now, this could be a little tricky, I guess, uh, on the car lot, because they always say, oh, this cell, oh, it's, <laughs> you know, it's so amazing. You just happened to walk onto the lot today, because uh, today, and only for today, we have a 10% you know, off the top uh, sticker price. Blah, blah. <laughs> only today. <laughs> Uh, if you come back tomorrow, it's, I can't I can't guarantee these prices, you know. Uh, they'll do all that, and they're trying to show you, hey, th you might be thinking to yourself, well, he's just full of it. I'm, you know, I can come back tomorrow, and I'll finally get an even better deal. So <laughs> you have to I really push you on this one. Uh, show that acting now will save uh, time or money. Uh, so I can think a lot of examples of that, too. It's, it's kind of really the same thing as the, as the first one. Uh, you might have a situation where uh, you've got some kind of damaged machinery at your at your company, right? And and or the D2L situation again. And you could say that, uh, you know, if we do this right now, uh, it's, it's a good time to do it. Uh, or maybe it's, maybe this is during the summer, right? So you can say, look, let's do it. It's summertime. There's not as many classes in session. Uh, we can upgrade to the new software. Uh, there'll be a lot less uh, downtime. Uh, it'll have a much less impact on uh, the school, basically, because most of the students aren't here. It's summertime. <laughs> if we wait and keep debating, uh, well, then uh, this, it'll be back in session, and then it's going to be a big, huge mess. Uh, yeah, that <laughs> I anticipated the third point there. Uh, if we keep on delaying, uh, this is going to get make it a lot worse. All right, and here's my uh, favorite appeal, the emotional appeal. And these are, I think, just so much more effective than anything else. I know professors are supposed to like the rational stuff, or reason and credibility more, but I think we're just being a little more honest with ourselves when we <laughs> agree that we're moved by emotions. We're emotional beings. And, uh, they've got a point here about storytelling, and I, I want to share with you, <clears throat> I was listening to a lecture series about uh, the Middle Ages, and, uh, you know, back in knights and castles, and <laughs> dukes, and all, all this uh, business, and the uh, professor was saying that uh, these the no so-called nobles, right, the rich people, uh, they, they had castles, and they were just really terrible people, I mean, they're out there killing and extorting it's kind of like basically thugs <laughs> you know so this guy would ride up on in armor on horseback and demand you know you give hand over all your money your your crops and if you didn't oblige uh, they'd kill you right or even beat up your horse and it's kind of weird but <clears throat> they would just start beating up your farm animals uh, and they're just ho horrible people. I mean, just the spick scum of the earth. <laughs> but they had the uh, the power. Uh, so what? So at the same time, you had the uh, the church had, of course, all these monks and priests, and uh, they were basically the only literate people at the time. Uh, the the priests, uh, the fathers, uh, church fathers, and whatnot. So uh, they came up on this strategy, and they tried a strategy at first of coming out with these lists of rules. Like here's how a noble should conduct him or herself, and then we, you know, don't uh, <laughs> basically stuff like don't uh, chew with your mouth open. And it gets a little more graphic than that, but it gives you an idea of just how barbaric <laughs> people were. Basically, etiquette guides, and those didn't go over very well at all. Uh, nobody cared about them, it's, you know. And the, you could think too, the Bible, you could tell somebody, well, look, it says right here, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> <laughs> Again, not people don't respond to that. It's just the rules, and we don't care about. Nobody wants to be the. Uh, I guess some people do, but uh, most of us just want to know the rules so we can break the rules. <laughs> well, that rule's there uh, for a reason. It must be for me to have less fun. Uh, so I'm going to break that rule. But anyway, uh, they found a better strategy, uh, which was um, these 
stories. Uh, so they wrote all these stories. They call them the chivalric uh, romances. You know, this uh, these knights, sort of fairy tale like stories that uh, these nobles and knights would be out rescuing uh, villages and saving uh, the damsel in distress. I guess uh, you know, think about all those Disney movies, basically that sort of thing. But they had uh, these these uh, knights in there acting heroically, doing the right thing. A very uh, if you go back to the original stories, they always emphasize how Christian uh, these people are. And that's because uh, the stories are being written by those priests and monks, right? So they, uh, they're very intentionally uh, spinning this all in the form of a story uh, because then uh, the nobles enjoy the stories. Uh, they, they love this stuff. You know, they've lapped it up uh, and in like a Lancelot. <laughs> what a great guy. <laughs> I guess he's probably not the best uh, example, but, you know, King Arthur... Uh, you know, you name it, you've, you've heard the stories at some point, I'm sure. Uh, but anyway, even today, uh, we get most of our behavior. We'll watch movies, shows, and you see characters that you like and you want to be like. And that has a lot more impact on you than just somebody giving you a list of rules. Uh, so anyway, I just all of this is to say, yes, <laughs> storytelling is crucial. Uh, even in the most boring business context imaginable, if you can put it in the form of a story and involve characters somehow, even if it's just personal anecdotes, uh, that will go a lot further uh, than just the dry facts. Uh, psychological descriptions. Oh, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> uh, well, this is a sort of like in the creative writing class. They talk about show, don't tell, right? It's sensory information. So being able to hear and see things, it's one of the nice things about a PowerPoint presentation is you can put pictures in there, right? And they can look and see something. Uh, I don't know about you. When I look at this picture here, I kind of have a pleasant emotional response to this. I kind of think, ah, oh, you know, that's nice. I can almost smell that, uh, this flower here. That looks like a very pleasant uh, sense there, um, tasting and touching. You know, one of my favorite things to do is when I'm at the state fair, I love going over there where they're showing where they got these uh, people doing the sales uh, pitches and they're showing you how to cook <laughs> their their product or chop onions or whatever it is. Uh, it's really an effective presentation because unlike a, watching a commercial on TV, you know, you can actually smell it. Uh, you can. Some, yeah, most of the times they'll let you uh, go up there and taste and touch it. <laughs> you can certainly hear it. <laughs> Uh, so it's a lot of stuff going on, and it's it's a lot more compelling. You know, I'll sit around, and it's not just me. You know, you'll see huge groups of people gathered around these people watching them, because uh, it's almost like a show, uh, more than it is just, you know, if you just saw it, uh, an advertisement for the same product in a magazine, it just wouldn't hit you that way. Now, they're saying here, though, a <laughs> word picture. Uh, so, yeah, you might not be able to demonstrate it, but you could at least mention the way that things sound and uh, smell and taste and touch. If you read novels like uh, The Jungle uh, by Upton Sinclair, <laughs> uh, he, he does a very good job of, I think that's Upton. Anyway, he's, he's very concerned about the meatpacking industry. I think it's in Chicago. Uh, so, man, he, when you read those descriptions about those, the way there's those cows are treated and butchered and the, just the filthy, it's just, uh, it just turns my stomach even today. It's been years <laughs> since I read that, but even now, just kind of making me, it's kind of grossing me out thinking about it. Uh, very, and that's all because he, he doesn't just say, well, you know, the, the conditions here at this factory are deplorable. There's no image there. It doesn't, doesn't resonate, doesn't do anything psychologically. Now you start talking about the the sounds of those cows screaming, the blood and the gore you see everywhere on the wall, the floor, the putrid smell, the rotten intestines. I mean, <laughs> now that is going to have an impact. Yeah, help help audiences imagine themselves doing uh, or enjoying uh, what it is uh, you ask. So that's used. People don't really care about other people when you get down to it, right? They just want to know, <laughs> how does this impact me? <laughs> what does this have to do with me already? Uh, so that, again, with the D2L and the bright space and the cloud and all, all that, uh, the professor just want to know, look, what, what is it going to look like? Uh, how, how is my experience going to be different? 
And you could really play that up. You could say, oh, yes, the, the new D2L cloud. <laughs> it smells so nice. <laughs> all right, I'm being a little silly at this point, but uh, you get the idea. You make it, a, it's what we've been saying all along. It's about you, or it's about them, I guess I should say. It's not about uh, the person writing it. It's, it's about that audience. So see if you can get inside their head. See if you can make them uh, see things and smell things and, and tell stories and involve them emotionally. And that will have the impact that you desire. All right, let's move on then to the tone. This is something that's always uh, tricky. You know, I've been reading, I've been part of a search committee. Basically, I'm uh, when they hire professors, it's not just one person that makes the decision. Uh, you have this chain of command, I guess, a hierarchy, and it sort of starts with this search committee. So there's three or four professors and we all look and there must be like 50 something applications, <laughs> cover letters and resumes or CVs, they call them. And there's just a lot of material to go through. Um, <clears throat> so this is all very recent in my mind. And they say here, be courteous. This is the first tip. And I have seen we already uh, Firsthand, you know, <laughs> you think uh, these people are applying to be professors, so they're very smart people, uh, obviously, but they might break some of these rules, and some, some of them have. They've, they've broken uh, this first one. You think, man, how dumb <laughs> you have to be <laughs> to, to not be courteous and respectful to the person that you're writing to to try to get them uh, to give you a job. I mean, it just seems insane. Uh, and yet you see uh, some very rude uh, stuff going on, very arrogant uh, cover letters. <coughs> uh, some, uh, a couple of them have uh, used the wrong, oh, I'll just, I'll just tell you the, the situation. <laughs> uh, so one of the, the sort of the uh, main person on the committee, uh, had, you know, we all have titles, you know, doctor, professor, whatever. Uh, and most professors don't like it when you just call them uh, Mr. or Ms. You know, especially in a formal uh, context like that, they want you to use their title, Professor So-and-So. And they've spelled it out in the job ad, you know, what the correct title is. Uh, but yet two or three people uh, just wrote in like, hey, uh, <laughs> dear sir, <laughs> uh, dear sir, colon. And it's like, uh, first of all, it's a, the, the ch <laughs> she, it's a woman <laughs> uh, that, that sir is not courteous. It's like, it's like a relic of the, I don't know, 18th century or something. I mean, my God. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry. I'm kind of, I'm just kind of stupefied by it. Uh, but yeah, being courteous. So if you know they want to be called uh, Professor So-and-so, Professor Smith, well, then obviously you want to use that. Uh I got a clip here I'd like to play at some point. Uh, if you ever watched that show, um, Dirty Jobs, there's a guy, the, the guy on that show is named Mike Rowe. He's, he's a really, I'm a big fan of his. He's got lots of great videos on YouTube you can watch. But uh, he was on one of these talk shows the other day, and they were asking him about, well, uh, what about this unemployment? Uh, why are there so few jobs? And, and he was uh, very candid in his response, candid. He just said that, you know, most people don't pass the drug test. <laughs> you know, they, they can't pass the drug test. Uh, boom, uh, they're ruled out. Uh, but even the ones that uh, do pass that, they aren't courteous. And the example he gave was just, again, just stuns me that somebody would do this. Uh, but he says that, yes, I guess it's very common. Uh, somebody will be interviewing somebody for a job and then that person's cell phone will ring in the midst of the interview and the person <laughs> will take the call, uh, go out or just talk right there to this person. And you're just like, man, uh, <laughs> you just don't deserve the job. <laughs> I mean, don't you have a clue? Uh, you know, and maybe people don't, you know, you know, so maybe that's why we need to not take stuff for granted and i'll just <laughs> just tell you all <laughs> if you think that would be okay to do you're wrong uh turn off the cell phone don't even bring the cell phone it's a job interview you know you, you want to be as courteous as possible <clears throat> all right anyway moving on <laughs> calm down matt <laughs> uh two giving solid reasons 
uh, for the requests. Uh, people don't, if you're asking somebody to do something, it's going to take a while or cost a lot of money. They need some good reasons uh, to go along with it, right? Uh, making the request clear, uh, this is a, always to me struck me as a sign of poor management. You know, they'll say, this needs to get done by tomorrow and all that. You know, well, what, what, what exactly is it you want done? Uh, well, and then you find out it's really kind of vague. Uh, you don't really know. You don't have a clear handle on what, what it is you're supposed to do. Uh, that's no good. I give enough information for the audience to act. And so, again, with those resumes and cover letters, I always emphasize this. And people just ignore it sometimes. I don't know. They'll have <laughs> to learn the hard way, I guess. Uh, but... If you want to get called in for that interview, you need to make sure uh, they know how to reach you. They might they might email or they might call, they might text. Uh, who, who knows how they'll want to reach you? But if you don't provide that information, <laughs> you won't be able to. <laughs> uh, tone down request to superiors, right? So if a student and a professor, the student shouldn't just make demands of the professor. You know, sometimes I get an email from a student, and I don't think they're trying to be rude. I think they just don't really realize that the tone they're giving off in that email. And again, a lot of this is, is why they say, just go to the office, meet face to face, because then you can avoid this uh, unintended um, uh, rudeness, I guess. But, you know, they'll say something like, uh, I need a letter of recommendation ASAP. <laughs> no, please. Uh, no, uh no uh, compliments or anything, I guess. Just just, just sort of a, a demand uh, that that gets done as, as quickly as possible. And sometimes it can get touchy, too, when uh, you're dealing with, uh, you know, if you're managing artists, let's say, or, or in, my, in case you can think professors, are, uh, they're kind of got a big ego. And you don't want to talk to them like they're just employees, right? A lot of times, uh, and students too, they don't, a lot of students and teachers too, they don't like the idea of treating, of somebody referring to students as uh, customers, right? They think it's, uh, it's not, they're not customers. <laughs> uh, they're better than that. They're more important than just a customer. Uh, anyway, uh, kind of getting off the point. So if you're writing to somebody higher up in the chain of command, I guess, uh, you want to make sure you're putting the please in there. Uh, might even be, might not be a bad idea to, <clears throat> Uh, write something like, uh, uh, do, uh, do you think you could <laughs> uh, have the uh, have the uh, resources here by tomorrow? Uh, thank you. Uh, instead of uh, a demand like, uh, send the report immediately. <laughs> oh, yeah, here's a good example. Let's see what they got here. Uh, uh, this first one, I, let's see. I expect you to give me a new computer. <laughs> I expect you to give me a new computer. Uh, this that certainly sounds imperious, right? It sounds like they're, uh, I don't know, <laughs> they're arrogant, I suppose. Uh, versus, if funds permit, uh, I'd like a new computer. Uh, so, this, so you can see how the second one's, <clears throat> let me read them again. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a cough. All right, I expect you to give me a new computer. That's the first one. Second one, uh, if funds permit, I'd like a new computer. So I think you can hear there how the one is certainly toned down. It sounds uh, less demanding. It sounds uh, certainly a lot more polite. I like how it says here, I would like a new computer. This would make me happy. Uh, people like to you know, make other people happy, right? So that would be uh, kind of persuasive there. The uh, If the funds permit, you know, shows you're kind of thinking about their point of view. Maybe they don't have the funds, right? Maybe they can't do this. And you're just saying, look, I realize that. Uh, so all those, it's actually kind of complicated when you delve into this, but anyway, the main idea there is if you're writing to your boss or you're somebody above you, or somebody they can either have you fired or flunk you, uh, you want to be careful that you don't come across as being uh, disrespectful to them. So you always have to keep that in mind, uh, you know, the, the pleas, uh, the uh, formal address, uh, <laughs> uh, not referring to somebody uh, as Ms. if she wants to be uh, referred to as a professor so-and-so. Just sort of common sense stuff, right?
And here we go with everybody's favorite <laughs> business document, <laughs> the performance appraisal. I'm being facetious, of course. Nobody likes these. They're vile, disgusting documents <laughs> to, have to write, <laughs> much less to have to read. Uh, yeah, it's great if you got a worker there that's uh, that's a great worker and you can just be complimentary the whole time, but you're going to be dealing with uh, somebody that's <laughs> not so great. Uh, it could even be yourself. And I just kind of try to relate these back to uh, when I'm grading papers. I think there's a lot of overlap there because you can think about a, you know, you, you write your book chapter, your proposal, whatever it is, your resume. Uh, you can think about that as a performance, right? And then my job as a, your teacher is to go back and then appraise that performance and say, is this a good performance? Is it bad? Uh, you know, so it's like almost, you can almost think about these kind of like being a, a report card on steroids. <laughs> Because uh, instead of just a letter grade there or a number grade, uh, you're going to have some specific things in there. <clears throat> yeah, and that's the first tip. Uh, so let's just say you're a manager and you've got a crew that you're working with and the performance season comes around. And what, sometimes these are yearly or I guess some even are like monthly, <laughs> depending on the company you work for. And they might say, we want you to, uh, to appraise everybody's performance. You, know, you, you might have three or four people there, uh, maybe more even, <clears throat> and you're doing this. Now, the first point is to cite uh, specific observations, not just make inferences. So you, you, you wouldn't want to generalize about somebody. I say, say, well, this person is lazy. You know, old uh, <laughs> uh, old Bubba, uh, he's a lazy son of a gun. <laughs> uh, that's just making an inference. <clears throat> if you wanted to be specific about it, you could say, he Bubba comes to work late every day, 10 to 15 minutes late. You know, here's the log. Uh, he punches out early every day, too, um, and he, do he doesn't come back from his lunch break until 15, 20 minutes uh, late from that even. Uh, you know, you could just, by the time you, you say all that, you got all that data, you don't need to draw the conclusion for them, right? Like they say, don't get your exercise jumping to conclusions. <laughs> That's the idea. Uh, another way to think about this is uh, just the facts, ma'am. If you watch detective shows, you know, they'll... Uh, the detectives will show up and they'll say, what happened here? Uh, can you describe the suspect? And they'll say something like, oh, that he's a murderer, criminal. Uh, you, could, you could just tell there was something shady about him, right? And they'll say, no, just the facts. Uh, how tall was he? Uh, how much did he weigh? Or, uh, <laughs> did he have a beard? <laughs> did he have a hat on? Uh, you know, that specific stuff, not inferences. Or when I'm grading papers, right, I... Uh, I don't say, well, you're a crummy writer. <laughs> you didn't spend any time at all working on this. <laughs> That's just an inference. I don't know that. Uh, you might have spent all day working on it. Uh, so I wouldn't do this. I would say, look, here's some specific things. Uh, there's some misspelled words on the on the resume. There's some, uh, the formatting here is really off. Uh, <clears throat> there's not enough detail in your job descriptions. You know, I'm giving us specific points there, not just making inferences, uh, including specific suggestions for improvements. Remember, the idea behind a performance appraisal is that uh, everybody, it's, it's about growing, right? It's, it's everybody's getting better, they're expanding their skill set, they're uh, doing whatever it takes to get ahead. Uh, so there's always going to be something in there, some ways it, it could be better, right? And that's just to be expected. It doesn't mean you're lousy, lazy, or whatever, uh, if you're getting one of these. It's that, <laughs> that's the purpose. <laughs> <laughs> is to find some way uh, it could be better. Um, so you, know, you could think, well, maybe this 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 resume could be better. Obviously, if it had been if it was proofread more <laughs> thoroughly, uh, if this section was expanded on, and so on and so forth. Uh, or with your employees, um, you know, maybe uh, Bubba should <laughs> try harder to be at work on time. Uh, maybe he should bring his lunch instead of going out uh, for lunch. You know, stuff like that. Uh, identify two or three areas that the worker should emphasize uh, in the next month or quarter. Uh, I like to do this when I'm working on papers or uh, portfolios. <clears throat> you know, I'll say something like, uh, you know, as you take more English classes, work on, continue to work on organizational skills. Um, and you still haven't quite got the <laughs> conclusion uh, down, you know, you know, keep working on that or transitions, whatever it is. Uh, the idea is you don't give somebody 17 things to improve upon. Uh, they just look at that and shut down. 
if you just give, yeah, maybe there, maybe the person's as a complete disaster. <laughs> uh, think about if you're coaching a team, right? Maybe you're coaching uh, soccer, basketball, whatever. You got some players there. Uh, they clearly need just tons of work. It doesn't do them any good to, you know, to give them uh, 50 things to work on, right? That's not good coaching. Uh, you just figure out, well, what are the two or three things that you feel like uh, you can make the most impact on over that next month? And let's work on that. Uh, we'll save the rest uh, <laughs> for later. Uh, and I, I think a lot, too, about martial arts classes. You know, if you got a good martial arts instructor, uh, a lot of times the, the new students will get kind of uh, upset because they don't feel like, you know, they want to be doing flying sidekicks and, and breaking bricks and all this stuff, <laughs> like the first week. And uh, they find out, well, actually, you know, the first few months, if not years, are just going to be the, these two or three uh, forms or katas. And uh, just, you might just do a snap kick. <laughs> it is like the simplest stuff over and over and over and over again. And that's, it's kind of coming back to this idea, right? It's, uh, they don't want you to have uh, 50 things to be working on. You know, you just work on two, maybe three things uh, at a time until you totally master those. And then you move on. All right, here we have the uh, recommendation letters. Uh, and I'm not going to go into detail here because it's kind of the same stuff. But, uh, you know, I get a lot of students obviously asking me to write them recommendation letters. And uh, I think about where they're applying to is... Are they trying to get into a graduate program? Are they trying to, uh, is this for a job? And sometimes, uh, a lot of times nowadays, it'll just be this online thing for me to fill out. And yeah, these are the kind of questions they ask. Um, how well do you know this person? How many years uh, did you know them? Uh, the first one there is to be specific. So if I wanted to say, usually I'll say something like, uh, <clears throat> this student is very, uh, a professional, very, uh, uh, very res responsible, uh, and then I'll follow that up by saying they, they always turned in their work on time, uh, they earned A's on all of their uh, writing projects, and maybe I'll even throw in some titles. You know, I'll say, well, they, uh, they did their book proposal on a very interesting topic. It was uh, blah blah blah, and they follow that up with a YouTube <laughs> tutorial video that was really. Uh, well polished, you know, so I'll try to go into some specifics to give the person a good idea about uh, what this person's actually like. Yeah, giving detail about their work. Uh, say whether the writer would rehire applicant. Uh, this one's kind of interesting. I've heard, uh, you know, obviously with a lot of this, there's a lot of um, uh, legal issues that go along with this. If, if you happen to work for an HR department, I'd like to hear your your take on this last one. Uh, there is some concerns about it, whether I guess that's ethical or not to say, whether you'd rehire them or not. Uh, I would kind of lean towards just not even saying that. Just uh, for me, the specter <laughs> of a lawsuit is just enough to kind of discourage that. And you got enough you could talk about here. And I'll, I'll tell you something else, too. It's, I've never been in a situation where a student that, you know, I didn't like and I felt was lousy, you know, comes to me for a recommendation letter. They, they just never would do that. <laughs> uh, so it'd kind of be redundant anyway. Obviously, if somebody uh, comes to me for a recommendation letter, it's because they, you know, they get, they get along well. Uh, they know they've done good work. Uh, they know it's going to be positive. Uh, so that's <laughs> just kind of not bother with that. All right, sales and fundraising purposes. I mean, this is a long chapter. I guess it needs to be long because they're talking about uh, persuasion. <laughs> Hopefully it's interesting enough to persuade you to keep uh, reading. All right, so obviously the, the sales and fundraising purposes, what are they doing? They're motivating you to act. Send us a donation. Order a product. If you listen to NPR, you know National Public Radio, they'll have these periodically, uh, they, they got, what do they call those, fun drives? <laughs> drives you crazy. You just want to break your radio when that happens. But uh, yeah, they're trying to get you to send in some money. I even, around campus, you might see different student organizations and they'll have, uh, you know, cakes, bake sales and uh, sometimes it'll be out on the grill. And part of that is uh, to get some money, right? So to raise some funds. I do this too. Um, with the fundraising, I have a YouTube video or YouTube channel. 
Um, and I don't have ads on the channel. I just ask people that watch the videos. I say, I say hey, if you like the video and you want to see more, uh, just go to the, my Patreon site and you can set up a uh, recurring payment on there, just a dollar per episode. <laughs> You know, I don't dwell on it too much, but a lot of people do, uh, they follow through on that. So I get like, uh, I don't know, something like four or five hundred dollars of funds and donations uh, sent in on that. So it definitely works. And of course, I know a little bit about this stuff because I've read books like this. <laughs> uh, but anyway, hopefully they'll get more in, into how to do it well. Maybe I'll be able to increase my uh, donations. I mean, I'm not trying to get rich off of it or anything. I just want to cover my... Uh, the expenses, right? Uh, let's see, secondary, uh, to build good image of communicators organization. So this, again, comes back to, I don't really have a, I'm not, when I'm doing those videos, I don't uh, represent anybody. It's just me personally, but uh, I can, like this video I'm doing here, though, it kind of reflects back on, you know, SESU, right? So if I was asking for funds, <laughs> uh, I'd have to keep in mind, uh, I don't want to come. I don't want to make the uh, organization sound bad. I'm like, yeah, since they pay me so little, I have to ask you. <laughs> I have to ask you for uh, additional funds. <laughs> I'd be totally screwing this uh, uh, secondary purpose uh, up. Now, let's see. To strengthen commitment of audiences who act. All right. So with the NPR thing again. Uh, a lot of times they'll say, and this is what I used to be a, I used to uh, donate to NPR. And they, I remember one time I said, I think I set, signed up for maybe like five bucks a month. And uh, I quit doing it though, because uh, they kept, it was just like the floodgates were open. You know, they started calling me all the time, emailing, it just went nuts. And they kept saying, uh, look, we need, you, you know, we need you to double this. <laughs> You know, double the in double the contribution, uh, blah blah. And they just kept on with that, and it finally just ticked me off. And I'm like, man, you, you know, <laughs> you're lucky you're getting the five. <laughs> so it didn't work on me. Uh, but that would be the secondary, uh, secondary purpose of this, right? So yeah, you're selling a product, you're raising some funds, uh, but part of that too is to, you know, if somebody's supporting NPR, maybe they maybe you want them to raise the, the level or, or do something else to support the uh, the organization. A lot of times these fundraisings, it's for some kind of cause, right? And you listen to NPR and they'll talk about how it's, it's not just the news, it's, it's kind of this whole <laughs> agenda, ideology <laughs> uh, that goes along with it. And you might uh, support that or you might not. Uh, let's see this, this last point, what is it? Uh, to make audiences who do not act uh, more likely to act uh, the next time. Let me think about this. So to make audiences who do not act more likely to act next time. Okay, I guess I can sort of see this. Yeah, the secondary purpose. Uh, so maybe you're out there uh, trying to raise some money for your, your bake sale <laughs> and somebody would, says, uh, look, I don't have enough money, maybe next time. And so they, they don't act that time, but nevertheless, now they're aware of it. Um, maybe uh, if they know when you're going to have your next sale, they'll uh, be sh maybe they'll double up at that point. So, yeah, I guess that makes sense. All right. Fundraising messages openers. Oh, OK. <laughs> you know, I love these. Uh, one of the nice things about being in, in uh, rhetoric is when you get junk mail, you like don't throw out the junk mail. Uh, uh, read it, you know, because it's, uh, you see, you get to learn about how uh, you open them. Uh, what's a good opener? Well, you look at all the junk mail. You'll see different strategies. Uh, you get the political flyer. Uh, you don't have to agree with that politician's message. Uh, who cares? <laughs> you know, I'm looking at it to see uh, how did they set this up? Uh, what did they, what's the first thing they say? How did they format this document? Uh, what color is it? You know, all this stuff. Uh, there's a science behind it. It's just really fascinating once you really start paying attention to it. Uh, but yeah, so we're thinking here about the first line. So you want to raise some money for your club. What should you start off by saying? And that'd be your opener first. <laughs> Basically, you think they'd open the envelope and what do they see first? Uh, so of course, it's helpful, I guess, to think about the goal. 
So you want them to read the entire message. You might have, I think they said somewhere like uh, the average um, fundraiser letter thing is like four or five pages. And I get tons of these things. And I'm a member of, a, what is it, uh, the, uh, the Planetary Society. <laughs> it's this uh, little group uh, they're interested in space exploration, like the science of it. And uh, they've got a few things they've done. And yeah, they're always uh, sending you these letters uh, asking for uh, money. But it's they, they're really good at really good at what they do, uh, the way they set up their their letters. It, you know, you, you actually can sit down and read this whole you know three or four page letter, and not feel uh, you know not feel bad at all. It's not boring at all. They, it's really interesting stuff the way they do it. Uh, I wish I had one here to to show you, but I'm sure you have plenty <laughs> in your mailbox. <laughs> all right. Anyway, what do you do? Uh, you could start by asking a question. So, did you know that? You know, NASA only spends uh, 14 billion, and if they had one more, <laughs> one more billion, they could uh, set up a Martian colony. Uh, and again, just making stuff up. Uh, but uh, questions are good because questions, if you think about what happens mentally, if I ask you a question, say, have you ever really thought about asking questions? Right? It's sort of, you can't help but uh, think a little bit, right? When you hear that question, you realize, oh, I'm supposed to. Uh, respond somehow and you sort of pause and it, it kind of comes back to you uh, so that's it's a good uh, strategy uh, let's see narration we've talked about these the stories uh, the anecdotes uh, i remember a couple of i guess it's a couple of years ago now that they had this big martian uh, rover and it was going to it was this really treacherous landing <laughs> you know it's it a good chance it might burn up i guess when it was trying to or crash when it was trying to land on Mars. And, and they really just, I mean, NASA just went all out. You got to give these guys and gals a lot of credit for that. Because, I mean, they made this like an exciting movie. It's like even more exciting than a, a big budget uh, Hollywood action film. It was fantastic. And they had the narration, the music. Uh, I mean, it was just really tremendous. And you know that this totally opened up the support for NASA. I mean, seeing something like that was wonderful publicity. Uh, so they it's just amazing. Uh, let's see, what do we have? Startling statements. So you can think about the numbers involved or a uh, striking uh, situation. A lot of people I know, uh, they're really affected again by those humane society uh, pitches. You know, so a lot of times, too, I think there's uh, one that goes something like, you know, you know, for the price of a cup of coffee, you could uh, feed a child in Africa today. You know, a starving child just for the price of a cup of coffee. Now, something like that startles you, and you're like, well, heck, that's just a, a couple of bucks. Kind of makes you think about it. And again, if more you be, you know, if you're thinking about something, that's you're almost like self-persuading, right? You're thinking, thinking, warming up to it. Uh, quotations, you know, these can take many different forms, but if you've got a quotation there by somebody that the audience will respect, <laughs> you know, old Mayor, uh, Mayor Clies, that's his name, right? Uh, the mayor of St. Cloud. I, I've seen him now for probably four or five times. Uh, he'll come to the graduation ceremonies here. And he gives a little speech and he has a quotation there. And he, he'll, he says he sets it up something like, and, and now I'd like to quote the famous philosopher uh, Homer Simpson. I'm pretty sure it's Homer. <laughs> but anyway, it's just somebody kind of silly like that. And I think I've heard him quote Dwight Trute uh, from the office a few times. It's just a way to set up his... Uh, his speech and of course it goes over well because everybody laughs and it's kind of the, this pop culture <laughs> reference you don't really it's kind of startling right you don't really you kind of look at the guys in a suit and tie you think he's going to be real serious and then he says something like that and it just kind of uh, warms everybody up they want to listen to him because uh, they think there might be some more funny uh, jokes in there he's a good speaker right uh, sets up the transition uh, to the letter body right so Again, a lot of times in introduction, you'll say, you'll mention the points you're going to cover. All right, and then, of course, moving on to the body. Uh, what do you do in the body? Well, you, of course, you want to think about the questions they're going to be asking. You know, if we had a three or four page uh, letter in the mail from NPR, and they're asking us to double our contribution, uh, what do you think would be some of the questions you, let's just say, hey, you like NPR. 
It's not like you hate them or anything, but you, you're still going to probably have some questions, right? So you might think, uh, what would those be? Uh, well, if it were me, I'd want to know, why do you need this extra money? I mean, don't you have enough money? I'm already giving <laughs> you the five bucks. Uh, how is this extra going to really make a difference? Uh, all of this stuff, right? So they need to have answers. And they might say something like, well, the... Uh, we know we used to receive all this federal money, but they've been cutting that back, cutting it back. <laughs> and now we have to, uh, we have fewer corporate sponsors. I don't know. Uh, that's for them to come up with, right? Uh, overcoming the audience's objections. So they did not They did not succeed here with me. Uh, they should have had a, if they had, I would have said, well, you know, okay. <laughs> you know, I thought I was giving you enough already, but clearly, uh, yeah, I can afford to give the 10. You know, I, I care about NPR that much. I, <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, involve the audience emotionally. Well, that's an interesting one there. And I, I've, I've heard NPR do this sort of thing. They'll talk about, uh, you know, they'll, they'll tell this little story about you get up in the morning, you wake up, you hear these voices, and, and it's uh, reassuring. And I, I've heard a couple of times they'll talk about how when you're over, you're on vacation or you're traveling somewhere and you can... I listen to NPR podcast and feel like you're at home. <laughs> so they have ways to bring you in emotionally. Or I guess they could talk about uh, how the NPR news is more objective or neutral, supposedly, than the um, commercial radio. You know, I don't actually buy that. <laughs> they, could, uh, they try to make out like that's the case. Uh, long letters work best. Yeah, here we go. Four pages being ideal. And this does seem to be the reality. Uh, like I say, I've when I saw this in the book, I, I instantly went out and started looking at some of the ones in my mailbox. And yeah, they're all about four pages, usually front and back, uh, four pages. So really, it's two pages, but it's, it's front and back. Uh, short letters, uh, emails work too. Although I think the emails are, you know, it's just so easy just to <laughs> delete, you know, just click the next one, don't even look at it. Uh, letters, though, uh, you know, you do have to do a little work. <laughs> you know, they might not have the garbage can right next to the mailbox. <clears throat> so you have to pick it up. You're holding it. You might just say, oh, I'll just open it. Uh, body content. Uh, this is about these fundraisers again. Uh, information the audience can use. Uh, I wonder what kind of, I guess this could be information like, uh, if it was NPR, maybe they've got some information there about the different programs and when the programs are available. Or uh, this new podcast, the app, uh, they got a new, uh, was it NPR One app? <laughs> and so I think I read about that in one of those flyers and my messages, right? And I said, oh, this sounds kind of, this sounds kind of cool. Uh, I could just uh, listen to the news on this and I don't have to wait for the, the hour, right? Or if I miss a show, I can go back and listen to it on that uh, that app. That's that's useful information. Uh, let's see, stories about history of product uh, or the organization. Uh, so this might be helpful. I know a couple of local services around town, if you need an electrician or a plumber or whatever. Uh, uh, sometimes they'll tell you a little bit about how they got started. They might say, we, we, you know, we've been here. It's a family-run business. Been in St. Cloud for 40 years. <laughs> business was started by old... Uh, JT, um, it's a Gump, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Once you know a little bit about a product, you might uh, be more likely to support it. It's interesting, right? You, you want to go, you always want uh, to be interested in things. Like, I didn't know until the other day that Snickers candy bar, I never really thought about it, but the reason it's called Snickers, it was that was the that family's uh, horse. So they had, a, I guess, a racehorse. <laughs> it was called Snickers the Horse. <laughs> so now I think about horses every time I want to eat a Snickers bar. Huh? <laughs> Did that work? I don't know. Uh, stories about the people who use the product. Oh, man, this is basically testimonies, right? So let's hear from you know Jill over here. She's been using a D2L uh, cloud base now for you know, a couple of months. Uh, <laughs> her productivity is shot up, blah, blah, blah. Especially if it's people like the ones you want uh, to buy it, right? 
Uh, word pictures of audiences enjoying the benefits offered. So they keep talking word pictures. Uh, I guess that's just their way of saying imagery. Uh, so again, the little stories describing somebody. Uh, you, know, you think about all those medications they're always trying to sell on television these days, right? Oh, take this allergy med or <laughs> whatever it is. And look, you can be walking, you'll be walking out in this dandelion field, not a, not a, not an ounce of snot in your nose, <laughs> if I wouldn't say that. <laughs> you know, you'll be able to smell the delightful flowers and maybe it's a hearing aid, right? So you'll be able to hear, the, just think of the joy of hearing your grandchildren's uh, voices again, you know? Uh, that's one of the benefits. And that word picture, again, a lot more effective than just uh, keep emphasizing the, you know, they probably don't even care about the technical stuff about the, let's say the hearing aid, right? They just want uh, to know how's this going to make me feel basically. All right, what is this? The fundraising messages, action close. Uh, <laughs> action close. <laughs> That's kind of a weird uh, word. Um, but yeah, the, the when I, I tell you this, when we did the, did the cover letters, I said, at the end of that letter, make sure that you close it by saying something like, please call me at this number, blah, 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 to arrange an interview. Thank you. You just tell the audience what you want them to do. And if you look at these flyers again, the, the, the fundraising messages, at the end, they'll always say, go to this website. Uh, here's the website and, and donate today or call this. You don't want the person saying, well, I'm convinced, but now what? <laughs> what do I do now? Uh, make the action sound easy. So I think every time I buy buy cars, and I've gone through this several times at this point, it's <laughs> I'm not a real I'm not real good at talking them down or anything. But I, know, I always enjoy watching the uh, salespeople do their thing, and I noticed that you know really it, it's quite tedious. Uh, to fill out all that paperwork. I, I recently bought my uh, first house and it was just staggering. Uh, the the paperwork uh, that goes with it, just hours and hours and hours of paperwork. Just, it was just, <laughs> I just had no idea. I probably, you know, if I'd have known how much paperwork was involved, I probably would have just stayed in the apartment and it was that level. Uh, but of course, uh, they don't tell you all this. They just make it sound like, oh, you know, well, I'll swing by tomorrow. We can fill out this paperwork or, uh, with the car. They'll just say, oh, just you know, step in. Let me get you. A, do you like a soda? Do you like some coffee? <laughs> this will only take a minute. <laughs> uh, or my favorite when you go to the doctor's office and they're like, oh, this won't hurt a bit. <laughs> You'll barely feel this. Ah! <laughs> uh, offer the audience the reasons to act now. Uh, we talked about this one before. You know, if, if you don't act now, NPR will have to start cutting programs and we're going to start with your favorite program. <laughs> uh, ends with a positive picture. All right, so you don't, you probably don't want to end on a sour note. And even with this, uh, these political uh, broadcasts, it's just kind of uh, inundated with these days. You notice they'll paint a pretty dire picture, right? Everything's just collapsing. Civilization, as we know it, is coming to an end. Uh, you know, the, the Statue of Liberty is in the ocean, <laughs> dumped over. I mean, everything is just gone, going to hell. But, but you know what? Uh, things will get better. Uh, we're making a difference. Just call the number, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I may recall a central selling point. Yeah, probably not the best strategy. You know, it's just hopefully they, they still remember it. <laughs> oh, and then the famous postscript or the... Uh, the P.S. And this is interesting. I, I didn't know this, but the book says this, and it's probably true. I'm going to test myself. Uh, <laughs> maybe to try it out on somebody. Uh, but they claim that when you get a letter and there's a P.S. at the bottom, that most people read the uh, that P.S. before they read the rest of the letter. Okay, so they'll start with that P.S., which that's pretty interesting. I don't know that's. I don't know why that would be. Uh, but apparently they've done some studies, I guess, and that's that's the case. So in other words, it's, it's pretty important to get it right. And I guess it's important to have one, uh, first of all, and then uh, second to uh, make sure that it's got the right content. 
I mean, it's just kind of the same stuff we've been saying. A reason to act promptly. You know, remember, P.S. Act. Do this immediately. <laughs> Don't wait. Call the number. Uh, because uh, this cell will only last, uh, you know, the next two, uh, next <laughs> couple of days. <laughs> Uh, this this dog over here will starve if you do not uh, call this number immediately. <laughs> I wonder, kind of a twisted shock jock, say something like that. He's gonna. Uh, anyway, I won't go into that. A uh, description of premium. Uh, description of the premium audience. What description of premium audience receives? Uh, so I suppose. Uh, was it NPR gives away like mugs and bags, umbrellas. Uh, that, that sort of thing. You know, P.S. If you act now, you can get this NPR mug. <laughs> it's, they always exaggerate it like oh, it's $200 value. <laughs> for, and everybody gets one for only the 10 buck uh, or $20 a month, whatever. A uh, reference to another part of package. You know, I guess you could say P.S. Uh, you will find. Uh, uh, don't forget to look at the resume. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Enclosed, you know, uh, you'll find a little booklet detailing uh, the new items in the catalog, uh, whatever. Uh, restatement of the central selling point again. Well, that'd be a lot of repetition, but uh, sometimes it's uh, repetition's not a bad thing. <laughs> That's kind of cute. So they put a P.S. on this uh, slide. P.S. Many people read it first, except you couldn't read it first because it didn't even appear until I clicked it at the end, but that is a besides the point. <clears throat> All right. Um, sales messages satisfying the, the needs. So tell people of need product meets, right? Well, why do they need this product? Uh, maybe they don't realize they needed it. Uh, so you have to tell them about it, right? Uh, and then you have to prove that this product satisfies uh, the need. Uh, so one of the famous examples of this uh, was Listerine uh, mouthwash. Uh, they created this fake illness uh, called halitosis. <laughs> Sounds kind of medical, right? <laughs> and it's basically bad breath disease. And they are saying that uh, this is a terrible problem, halitosis. And the, usually the examples were women uh, not being able to get married because they had uh, halitosis and the men wouldn't date them, right? Wouldn't ask them out on, on a date. <laughs> I mean, this is old, like 1800s or 1900s stuff, so it's not exactly politically correct. Uh, but anyway, that, that's what they were doing, right? They're saying, look, you have this this need to have uh, nice breath, and then they would go into lengthy paragraphs about Listerine and, and how it fought the germs, I guess, and then yada yada. And so they had to prove that it solved the problem, uh, showing why it's better than similar ones. So, you know, there's a billion um, mouthwashes out there. What makes Listerine so great? Uh, make audience want to have it. You know, some of the funny ones, uh, if you ever watch the, like the Axe body wash or the, the Geico, a little lizard and stuff. You know, it's pretty boring stuff. I mean, really, when you get down to it, um, soap <laughs> and insurance. I mean, how boring. Uh, but they kind of put this fun little spin on it. It kind of makes you want to have it. Uh, just because it's fun, right? You just kind of enjoy it, even though it's, if they just had, uh, man, can you imagine how boring that those insurance commercials would be if they just focused on like the the money involved and the statistics? <laughs> it puts you to sleep. All right, dealing with the price. So obviously stuff has a, a cost that goes with it. <clears throat> and some of these uh, political uh, groups, they will have a line of products. Uh, that they're trying to sell you, and they'll say, buy these products, they support the organization. And then you'll, you'll click on it, and you'll say, wow, this is like, a, I don't know, some kind of supplement there, and they're <laughs> like a sleep supplement, and it's like 60 bucks for a little can, a little a jar of it. And you think, well, that is a lot more than it should be, right? And then they'll say, well, but look at the benefits. You know, what? can you put a price on a good night's sleep? <laughs> Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, we only use the best ingredients and so on, non-GMO, blah, blah, blah. Uh, link price to benefits your company offers. Right? So the example there was uh, 
Yeah, you know, the D, let's go back to D2L. <clears throat> if you say, well, D2L Cloud, uh, it will cost more, uh, but it's got benefits. It'll be 24-7 uh, tech support, and we'll provide that. You don't even have to deal with it at your campus. And I'll show how much product costs each day, week, or the month. <laughs> yeah, so this is a common one. Uh, they might ask you for, you know, say, a $100 donation, right, or 50 bucks a month. Well, let's just say you think about your cable bill, right? And you say, wow, this is a hundred bucks a month. What? You know, I'm not going to pay that. Yeah, they say, but wait, don't think about it as a hundred bucks a month. You know, think about it as, uh, you know, <laughs> how many times are like uh, 30 going to 100? Like, what about three and a half dollars, somewhere around there? Let's just say four bucks. Just think about it like four bucks a day. You know, is it, uh, do you watch about four bucks a day worth of television? You know, is it worth that to you? Seems a little easier to think about it that way. Uh, or with the car, you know, you might look at that, uh, be looking at that uh, Ford F-150 Raptor and say, whoa, you know, $80,000, $90,000, ah, yeah, yeah, but uh, <laughs> let's think about it this way. <laughs> you know, that's only uh, only $1,000 a month. Uh, that, doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't really work for me either, but uh, at least it sounds a little less uh, uh, shock-inducing, I guess. Uh, allow customers to charge sales or pay in installments. They used to have a thing called layaway uh, where you could uh, just put a product, uh, have them hold it for you, and then you'd pay so much on it per month or, I guess, uh, whenever you wanted to. Uh, but this could be, you know, sometimes uh, they, you know, I've heard this theory that one of the reasons they wanted us to switch to credit cards and debit cards so bad was that uh, you, you're not really as conscious of the money you're spending if you're just, you hand somebody a card, you put your PIN number in, you know, bada boom, bada bing, you're not really thinking too much about it. Uh, whereas before, if you, you had to have the wallet full of uh, cash, right? You'd be, there's 20, there's 40, 60. You, you're thinking a lot more about the money you're spending. And it made people want to save more. Uh, now that everything's digital and basically this invisible money, uh, for all intents and purposes, we're just kind of going nuts, you know? And it's not probably not the safest way... <laughs> <laughs> uh, to go. Uh, but anyway, I guess looking at it from the other side, yeah, that somebody would, if you just had cash only, it's not just inconvenient, uh, but it makes making people too aware of the money they're spending, right? So they don't want you to do that. I've even noticed that the casinos nowadays, uh, they will have, uh, you just put money on a card and just be charging up this card. And that way you only think about the money once, <laughs> charging up the card, and then you just uh, have that piece of plastic for the rest of the time. Uh, let's see, vicarious participation. So this, again, thinking about the fundraisers, thinking about Humane Society, uh, uh, what some of these other ones, like the, the Red Cross or the Salvation Army. Uh, so you see the, the Salvation Army, and that one to me kind of stands out because it's very visible around the holiday season. You'll see these folks out ringing the, the bell with a little bucket, right? And you, where you see the Salvation Army uh, Center here in town, stores, so very visible. And you probably look at that and you think, you know, I feel a little guilty, <laughs> right? Because these people, are the, you know, they're trying to do something about poverty. Um, I'm not, uh, I don't have time or whatever. So you feel kind of guilty, uh, but they can make it sound like, yeah, but if you contribute some money, it's just like you're, it's almost as good as if you're uh, there, uh, you know, giving people the food, right, or, or providing the shelter yourself, or, you know, volunteering. And so they'll try to be inclusive. They won't talk about them, you know, they'll talk about us and, you know, join us, <laughs> be part of the team, be part of the Salvation Army, right? Uh, even though really you're not, <laughs> really you're just uh, dropping some change in there or setting up on a, uh, a subscription or whatever, uh, they want you to feel this what they call a vicarious, right? So you're kind of imagining, it's almost like you're imagining that you're the one out there uh, donating. Or with the Humane Society, uh, again, maybe you don't have, maybe you do uh, you know, have friends that volunteer at the uh, for the shelters and they're actually bringing in uh, animals to care for. Uh, but most of us don't have the wherewithal for something like that. Uh, but they can make it sound, you know, if they do a good job, they can make it make us feel like we are uh, participating uh, vicariously. 
So use you to talk about what audience will be doing. So let, let me show you what your donation will, <laughs> will be doing. <laughs> By do donating five bucks, uh, you will be providing uh, programming. Uh, you will be uh, for, uh, feeding a dog. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not really. I'm just sitting here, but uh, you get the point. Uh, show how audiences' dollars help solve the problem. Jump the gun on that one. Uh, more about the fundraising messages. Uh, provide lots of information to persuade the audience. Uh, give evidence to use with others. Now that that's an interesting one. So gives evidence to use with others. So let me think about this a little bit. So yeah, you know it, it's true. A lot of those uh, ads and flyers will say things like uh, share this with your neighbors, right? Or uh, talk to your colleagues at work. Uh, I've seen some. Uh, they'll be talking about a political cause and they'll say, uh, here's some points that you might uh, raise uh, at, at the office. You know, somebody's arguing the other point of view, right? And uh, gives you some figures to work with and basically turning you into uh, a persuader, right? So you're kind of out, you, you kind of uh, uh, drink the Kool-Aid as it were. <laughs> and now you're out trying to convert other people to the cause and they're making that easier for you. Uh, give image of strong, uh, worthy cause uh, to non-supporters. Give images of a strong, worthy cause to non-supporters. Uh, oh, I suppose so. <laughs> uh, suggest other ways the audience can help. Uh, so a lot of the times, uh, I notice with these ads, they'll say something like, uh, look, even if you're not able to donate, uh, just you know, share this message on Facebook. Just retweet this uh, message, right? Or, or, or uh, put this uh, infographic up somewhere on campus, right? And, and, you know, so you, yeah, you could raise, um, you could just give us money, but there's other ways to help too. And sometimes those other ways can be actually be more effective. You know, I notice um, on my YouTube channel when I ever now <laughs> I keep forgetting to do this, but I used to say, uh, yeah, go ahead and share this on your Facebook page, or retweet it. A post about it somewhere that you think people might be interested in the topic and uh yeah that's you know the more people that watch it the more likely it is that one person out of that group uh will donate all right how much to ask for <laughs> link the gift to what it will buy uh, offer a premium for giving ask for a monthly pledge yeah so these are all common strategies i'm sure you've seen these a million times you know, if you donate five bucks a month, that, that will get, provide so many meals, so many, uh, save so many animals, etc. Uh, if you give a hundred bucks or more, you get a, um, a t-shirt, a mug, hat, whatever. And yeah, make it a monthly pledge. You know, it's, it's really great for these organizations. And I can speak from experience. Uh, they don't like the one-time donation. You know, you want to just say, look, I'll give you a hundred bucks and that'll be good for the year, right? They don't like that because it's so unpredictable. It's hard to have a good business model when you don't know, you know, you got, you know, this the flux, it's just flying all over the place. You know, maybe the Christmas season, you're getting a huge influx and you might get nothing the rest of the year. You know, it's, it's hard to deal with that. And so they're always trying to push you into this monthly subscription because with that, it's a lot easier for them to predict, you know, how much income they'll be having uh, for any given month and they won't have to worry about going dry. Uh, so that's the reason for that. And then always send a thank you to every donor. You know, you ought to, that should go without saying, but it just takes a few seconds. I send a little, I just send people emails when they sign up and say, you know, thank you for blah, blah, blah. Put their name in there, my name. I imagine they'd be pretty insulted if I didn't even bother. Okay, let's see. Logical proof and fundraising messages. <laughs> Now, no, logic, okay. Uh, the body must prove that uh, the problem deserves attention. Well, this is certainly crucial. Uh, you see this a lot in uh, both sides around this whole global uh, warming, climate change uh, stuff you keep hearing about. Uh, a lot of people say, look, this is a really serious problem. It's, it's a cl calamity. <laughs> then you got the other side, though. They'll diminish this and say, really, this will, this will take care of itself. Or it's, it's not really a big deal. Uh, so problem can be alleviated or solved. 
So again, with the climate change, it wouldn't do. It wouldn't be any purpose if they're just out saying, "Look, uh, yeah, there's nothing we can do about it. It's too late. <laughs> uh, the seas are going to rise. The icebergs are going to melt. The, the penguins, the penguins are going to go extinct. Too bad." <laughs> You know, there wouldn't be any point to that. That wouldn't, you know, where's the persuasion, right? Uh, there must be something we can do. At least that's what, what you're claiming. And yeah, your group is helping to solve uh, that problem. Private funds are needed. A lot of people just assume uh, college campuses, for example. Now, I don't think St. Cloud State does a very good job of this, to be honest, but uh, there's a lot of private funds uh, for the, that usually come to a university through alumni or alumni, uh, alumnus, <laughs> what's the word? Uh, people that graduate, uh, they get letters and they're said, you know, please, uh, you know, if you like St. Cloud, if it helped you out, if it, is an <laughs> if it was enjoyable, <laughs> uh, send some money in, right? Because uh, we need the money. We need those private funds because a lot of people just assume, well, it's a state university, so the government covers everything. And, you know, it's really just not true. There's a huge deficits. It's a big, uh, big problem, right? So what am I doing there? I'm doing number four. <laughs> Telling you, you, yeah, you're paying tuition. A lot of people say, well, I paid the tuition. My God. Uh, but actually, a lot of that doesn't even go to the university. It goes to the state, and then the state decides uh, how much to give back uh, to the university. So even that's not direct. The only thing that's direct is if you is it, go to the alumnus, donate as an alumni, uh, that goes to, you can say where you want it to go. That's it. Your organization will use the funds wisely. Uh, I see, I don't, I don't know how many of you uh, folks are into gaming, uh, but there's a lot of these games these days will be uh, kickstarted, and they'll be asking for money to, to make the game. And that you're uh, worried, though, because you might spend 50 bucks, and you're not guaranteed that you're going to get a game at the end of this. They might... Uh, not be able to finish the game, or they might just take the money and go to uh, Las Vegas with it. You know, who, who knows? Yeah, so they have to convince you they're, yeah, we're credible. We're going to use the funds uh, wisely. We're going get, to get it done. All right, then just to finish up here, a couple last slides. Uh, what <laughs> writing style should be? Uh, they talk about, a, in, yeah, make it interesting. That just kind of go without saying, I suppose. Uh, tight. So usually you won't see big, huge paragraphs in these letters. It'll be just two or three lines. Uh, sometimes they'll use a variety of fonts, stuff underlined, um, stuff in italics. You know, they'll kind of go a little crazy with it because they want it to really pop, right? Uh, conversational. So I noticed with the Planetary Society, there's a couple other ones I'm part of. Uh, they usually have somebody famous like Bill Nye, the science guy, uh, or... Uh, uh, one of them has the guy from Star Trek Voyager that played the doctor. <laughs> Can't think of his name. Uh, but anyway, pretty well-known guy. So it'll always be, the letter will supposedly be from him. And it'll say, uh, you know, dear Matt. Uh, you know, it almost sounds like he's my buddy or something. Uh, obviously, I've never met the guy. <laughs> he's probably always surrounded by bodyguards. I'd probably get shot if I tried to go uh, have a conversation with him in real life. Uh, but the letter, though, makes it sound like he's just my old pal. Uh, to using those psychological descriptions again, the imagery we talked about, you know, make them hear something, make them see something. Uh, give them a picture. Describing those benefits again. Well, why donate to NPR? Uh, well, uh, you're listening to NPR right now, aren't you? <laughs> Don't you want that to continue? <laughs> uh, if you donate now, my God, you know, we can knock a day off this pledge drive. Whew, okay. <laughs> uh, describe the problem the uh, product solves. Um, again, with that, that D2L cloud thing, uh, the problem that's solving is the having a, the, have a tech support server, dedicated servers on all these campuses, uh, having a big, massive uh, uh, bottlenecks every time there's a need to update it. Uh, there's a lot of problems that that would solve, allegedly. All right, well, uh, second to last slide. <laughs> I'm sorry about this. It's just a really, for some reason, this chapter was about twice the size uh, of the other ones. But... All right, make message sound like a letter, uh, not an ad. Uh, we've covered that already. They 
again, usually say, uh, yeah, one person talking to another. So, you know, here's Bill Nye, or here's, uh, uh, who is it, uh, the, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> I think I've gotten some letters from him. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, but it will say, dear Matt, and it, it sounds like it's talk, it sounds like it's Neil deGrasse Tyson. Just Neil and Matt having a, a talk. <laughs> That's what they're going for. <laughs> uh, informal. Uh, so again, thinking about this fundraising letter, the sales letter, uh, it shouldn't sound like an academic report, right? They're going to go all out, try to uh, warm up to you, uh, try to get familiar with you, really. Uh, they want you to see them as kind of their, your buddy, uh, not just the person in a suit with a corporate speak. That's more informal. Uh, creating the persona. Uh, the character who writes uh, the letter. So if they've got a little saying, a uh, little catchphrase, they might put that in there. Uh, they might put little anecdotes about, you know, how did they get to be in this position? Or uh, they'll tell a little story about when they were a kid. Just uh, anything they can do uh, to make you kind of identify with that person and think about them as a kind of like a character in a story, even, or a, a movie. All right. Whew. <laughs> Last slide. Oh, man. Oh, no. Technology and persuasion. Now, this is a, I had to be honest with you, this is one of my favorite topics. This is where I, I focus most of my research on. I kind of, uh, it's, it's too bad there's only one slide to talk about it, but I guess we're getting close to two hours here anyway. Uh, but yeah, I love this. If you ever want to talk about technology and persuasion, you can, you're certainly welcome to drop by the office. We, I could talk about this stuff all day. I've done a lot of uh, research into it. It's, it's just fascinating. Uh, anyway, uh, television is, is it, what is this? Television is traditional method to reach the wide audience. Now, you probably know this is not really true. Uh, you know, the, uh, you watch a convert. You watch a. I, I try to watch. <laughs> I can't talk. <laughs> uh, you turn on the TV and it just seems like ad after ad after ad. And it really just turns me off. But I notice that almost all the ads, you know, depending on the show you're watching, they, they try to cater to different demographics. And you can tell a lot about a channel uh, by the uh, the ads. So if you watch you know, Fox News, for example, uh, or really any news channel, uh, my brother uh, works for, well, what is it? Uh, I'm probably going to get it wrong. I think NBC. <laughs> Uh, and it's the same thing. It's just ad after ad. But anyway, almost all the ads are f intended for uh, older folks. Right? So it'll be all the stuff about medications and uh, references to grandkids and like, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I'll go into uh, the details there. But basically stuff that has to do with uh, aging, uh, aging related products. So that kind of that's kind of a clue there that if you're wanting to reach a younger crowd, uh, a spot on TV is probably not the way to go. You know, same thing with radio ads, like NPR. Uh, you, they don't have ads per se, but they, they have all these, uh, you know, this program is sponsored by blah, blah, blah. And there's this Augsburg College. I feel like they, <laughs> I've heard that stupid line about it. Augsburg College, we are Augies. <laughs> like, you are annoying, what you are. Anyway, uh that's a, they, they're advertising on NPR basically because they think that's a right audience. Um, you know, somebody listening, they, they know some things about that audience. NPR, I guess, is more of a literate, probably more of a liberal crowd, to be honest with you, uh, listening to that. Uh, anyway, uh, you know that that's not really the, so good, though, for younger people, right? So, uh, what's the alternative? Uh, the alternatives are the uh, social networking. Uh, I'm not really sure why websites is on there. I would cross that one out. It's mostly the uh, social media. Uh, so you see all these companies, and man, I'll tell you this, if you want to get a good job as a communicator, uh, it's just right now, it's, it's hard to go wrong with social media. And so if you really beef up on Twitter, Facebook, uh, Snapchat, uh, LinkedIn's another one, it's more of a professional site, uh, YouTube, you know, all that stuff, all the companies are just begging, you know, for people with expertise in those. And basically, the, you basically have a job just sitting there uh, tweeting and responding to tweets or uh, creating content for a YouTube channel. And I, I just think it's a lot of fun, uh, personally. Uh, there's a lot of demand for it uh, because 
people of a certain age aren't comfortable on these things, right? And, and you have to be, uh, the trick to it is, uh, just you have to strike just that right tone, right? So you, you don't want to sound too formal or too ad-like. <laughs> Nobody's going to retweet an ad uh, unless there's something in that ad that speaks to them, right? That, that's funny, humorous. I mean, I think my dream job would just be sitting around making memes. <laughs> you know, I would have such a fun time with that. Uh, maybe I should uh, retire from uh, professing and just make memes all day. Uh, okay, uh, smart organizations are getting people outside the company uh, to be the sales force. So I noticed this with Amazon. They, they, Amazon is pretty clever about this third one here. Uh, so they have a lot of options on for sharing. They'll have all these sales on all the time, and they'll say, uh, you know, if you share this, uh, if you retweet this or something, then you'll get uh, all kinds of benefits, right? And I, I noticed one of them was... They call them Amazon giveaways. And it's an app. If you get on the Amazon store, uh, there'll be this giveaway section. And you look, and all of it will be things like uh, free, or you get a chance to win. Just all manner of things. I mean, like a blender. <laughs> and you'll click on it, and it'll say, uh, just tweet this message on Twitter. And somehow or another, it can tell that you've done that, and it'll put you into the contest, right? Now, if you think about what they're doing, it's they're, they're kind of leveraging your Twitter account. So if you have hundreds of people following you on Twitter, well, that's a pretty good advertisement they're getting. And they didn't even have to give you anything. All they had to do is enter you into this contest. And I've done it about 20, maybe 30 times, and I never won anything. Uh, so they must not have hardly any any prizes. You know, it's just <laughs> it's pretty uh, crummy. They ought to give you something. Uh, but yeah, referral systems, any of that stuff is great. And, and that's what these companies are looking for, right? Because this true today, true eternally, I think, is the best advertising is the word of mouth advertising. If your friend is telling you you should try something, your, your family uh, supports something, you'll be a lot more likely. That's going to carry a lot more weight uh, than just some advertisement or some commercial. So anyway, that will do it. Again, very sorry it's, it's such a long lecture. Uh, however, if you do have comments, questions, uh, fun stories, hey, I'd love to hear them, and uh, see you next time.